I looked shortly before class and noticed that um, almost everyone has submitted homework number two uh, with the PDFs. And I know that was probably very stressful to get the assignment on Tuesday and have to turn right around and submit it on Thursday. That's a short period of time. Um, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to do the exact same thing today. I'm giving you the assignment today, and homework three is due on Tuesday. But then this three assignment sequence of back-to-back -back submissions is going to finally slow down, and we're going to have more time between assignments. And so it was just that we're covering lots of information, lots of little things at the beginning of the semester. And then finally, it'll be more relaxed after we get through homework number three. So. Uh, in class today, I'll give you that third assignment. It's actually pretty simple, the third assignment. Uh, I don't expect that it will take too much time, and we're going to go through some examples in class today that will, I think, make that even easier than it otherwise would be. Any schedule or announcement questions that you'd like to ask about before we get into stormwater detention? We're going to begin by looking at a bunch of pictures. And unfortunately, there's so many slides today. That's why I printed six to a page and front and back, because I didn't want to use up every scrap of paper the department owns, since there's so many of us and lots of slides today. So ordinarily, I'll do three to a page, and you have space to take notes. But today, I just really wanted to save paper. Um, before we get into that, though, here's an example that's going to illustrate what units you should use in the rational method. Maybe I shouldn't have dimmed the light so soon. I forgot about this example. Um, so we have a <coughs> catchment that has an area of 10 acres. And so here is some surface. It's probably a field. And it has an area of 10 acres. Uh, in SI units, that's uh, 40,469 square meters. And the, let's assume a storm of 4 inches per hour. Now remember, with the rational method, it assumes that the storm continues indefinitely. And, and so this is going to give you the peak runoff. We don't have to know the time of concentration if we assume that the storm intensity is steady. And we have a runoff coefficient of 0.7. That's unitless, and so we don't have to have a different C value for SI or for traditional units we have the same C value either way. We want to know what if, what's the peak runoff. And uh, our formula, the rational method, Q equals CIA, when we're doing it in traditional units, we're going to get uh, cubic feet per second for the runoff Q. And that comes from multiplying inches per hour by acres. And actually, there's also a conversion factor of 1.008. But that's so close to 1 that most of the time we just ignore that conversion of 1.008. And I'm not even going to write it down, but I wanted to mention to you that, strictly speaking, if you have inches per hour and acres and you want to get cubic feet per second there, it's just coincidence that, that those work out. It, it ordinarily wouldn't. It's just a strange coincidence. And so let's look at it in the uh, traditional units. We have um, 0 0.7 is our runoff coefficient. And that's the ratio of runoff to precipitation. Our storm intensity is 4 inches per hour. And the area is 10 acres. And so that gives a, uh, a Q of 28 cubic feet per second. Just for sake of comparison, I'm going to convert that into cubic meters per hour, just because when we do it in um, SI units, that's what we'll get. But um, Inches per hour times acre gives us cubic feet per second. And um, if we wanted to find how many cubic feet, uh, how many cubic meters per hour that is, uh, it would be 28 cubic feet per second. And we would multiply it by 3,600 seconds per hour. And so now that gives us cubic feet per hour. And then we can divide by 35 
0.315 because that's how many cubic feet there are per cubic meter. Okay, so this works out to approximately 2854 cubic meters per hour. But let's work the whole thing from the SI standpoint, too. Rather than converting from our traditional units into SI units, we'll start from the beginning with SI. So Q equals CIA. Um, we've got 0 0.7 is the runoff coefficient. The rainfall intensity is 0 0.1016 meters per hour. And the area 40,469 square meters. All right, that is uh, 2878 cubic meters per hour. So this is completely accurate. This thing, remember I said that really what you need to do is then multiply by 1.008. You can see that when we converted it into cubic meters per hour, it's a little bit lower than that. That correction factor would fix it, but the reason why we don't bother multiplying by 1.008 is because usually we don't have such an accurate guess of the C value that we need to worry about such a small correction. Our C value is just an approximation and, um, and usually a pretty rough approximation at that. So, this rational method, you should never assume that the precision of your rational method calculations is better than 20 or 30 percent, because it, it usually overestimates, and, um, and the C values are, are hard to nail down. You can calibrate your calculations afterwards. Like if we went to this parking lot out here, and we actually measured the runoff during a storm and we measured the rainfall intensity, then we could experimentally determine what the C value is. And that would be better than looking it up on a table if we experimentally determined our C value. But I wanted to illustrate the rational method uh, with both sets of units just to tell you that the C value is unitless. It's coincidence that we get cubic feet per second in the traditional units, but you can always count on the SI. Any questions before we move on? All right, now we get a look at pictures. <coughs> the first day of class, that quiz that I gave you, I asked you to guess what happens when an area is urbanized. And urbanization is when we start taking a nice area that is forest or woods or grasslands and we pave over it because we have to have pavement to drive our car on, and we have to have pavement for the foundation of our house, and the house is impervious, and so human development inevitably decreases the ability of water to infiltrate into the soil. And so the answer to that quiz question when I was asking you what will happen to the amount of runoff now the peak runoff flow rate is going to increase. Here we have two curves. What this is showing, this curve is called a hydrograph. Hydrograph means a graph of water. It's the graph of water coming out of a watershed when it rains. Before urbanization, we had this lower graph. And so when it would rain in this certain area that used to get, that eventually got developed, before it was developed, the the certain size storm would have the water very slowly increasing and then it would come to some peak runoff and then it would taper down again. But after urbanization, when we have more pavement and actually um, it's not just paving over the surface, it's also disturbing the soils, generally will decrease their ability to infiltrate. If you compact the soil, think about how easily water is going to be able to percolate through uh, soil that's compacted. So that's part of the equation too, but uh, in both cases, um, impervious area and compacting soil, it means that the peak comes faster, you know, how much time from the beginning of the storm till the peak. When you urbanize, the peak comes sooner and there's a higher runoff rate. 
So this is the hydro graph. The graph that's above it is called a hyetograph. And let me write that on the board. H-Y-E-T-O-G-R-A-P-H. And what it means is it's a graph of rainfall. Rather than graphing the runoff that's coming out of a watershed, the hyetograph is a graph of the rainfall that falls onto the watershed. And on the horizontal axis, we have time. And on the vertical axis, it is showing the rainfall rate and also the infiltration rate. So okay, this, this blocky line here is the amount of rainfall. So we can think of this as a three-hour storm. We don't know that they're hours, but it's time increments. So let's just say that it's hours, for example. During the first hour, the storm was uh, this size. Maybe this is two inches per hour. And then the storm intensity goes up. It looks like it's maybe now three inches per hour. And the storm intensity decreased for the third hour of the storm, and then it stopped raining. Let me ask you this. Why does the, uh, why does, after it stops raining, it stopped raining here, why is the flow rate coming out of the watershed still increasing even after it stops raining? Shouldn't it immediately start going down if the rain stops? That's right, it takes time for the water to travel. And so if this is a big watershed, you know, here we have a watershed. Well, the rain fell for three hours. But maybe in three hours, only this area is contributing to the outlet. Maybe we have some rivers that's further away, and it takes a long time. Maybe it takes six hours for the water to travel over the surface, enter the river, and finally go to the outlet. And so the delay between the end of the rain and to the peak is because of the travel time. And we sometimes call that routing. And routing routing is the process of water traveling through a network. And you've heard of a router before, like a wireless router. And that takes your computer signal and puts it onto the network of the internet. Well, routing is also, in hydrology, the process of water traveling through a system and entering a drainage network. And we can think of it as a delay time, a lag. So that's one effect I wanted to point out here. Now, back to the hyetograph. <clears throat> There's two curves here. There's the curve of before urbanization and after urbanization. And I don't want to get into these curves in too much detail because we're going to talk a lot about infiltration in a future class lecture. But what you'll notice is that the infiltration rate is decreasing over time because the, uh, the soil is becoming saturated and it can't absorb more water as it gets saturated. So the infiltration rate decreases. But after urbanization, the infiltration capacity of the soil for the whole watershed is even lower than it was before. So that's why the line is above for before urbanization compared to after. So think about what kind of quiz questions do I like to ask. I like you to e explain a concept. So maybe I would show you the hydrograph, and I would say, why is the infiltration before urbanization line above the one after urbanization. And so those are rates. If you look at the y-axis on that graph, a rate means a certain amount of uh, intensity per time. So how many inches per hour of water are infiltrating into the soil? And urbanization decreases the rate that water gets into the soil or infiltrates. Any questions or comments about the effect of urbanization? You see what I did there is I opened the floor to comments in addition to questions. So you used to say, urbanization is bad, or I don't like urbanization. You, you just, when it's open for comments, you can say really whatever comes to mind. Okay, so here are in the following slides, 
ways that we can respond to urbanization, where we know that humans are inevitably, inevitably going to disrupt the environment and make changes to the surroundings. And so how can we try and change it so we avoid this change? We don't, we don't want the peak to be higher, and we don't want the peak to come sooner. By the way, why not? Why does it matter? What's so bad about this? Flash flooding, yeah. It, if you have too many um, urbanized plots of land in a watershed, then the water will come very quickly through the channel. And so the river maybe doesn't have enough space for all of the water. When the peak is higher, that means there will be more flooding. That's why it's not desirable. Also, it erodes soil. And so it'll take the important soil downstream and deposit it into the ocean where we really want the soil to stay on the farmland or um, in people's yards. And so these, all these next slides are different ways that we can try and prevent the curve from going higher and sooner. So all of these are trying to slow down the water and also trying to promote infiltration. All of these methods try and encourage water to get into the soil instead of running over the surface. So you could say each one of these is trying to change the C value to become lower. It's trying to reduce the effect of urbanization. So one of them is to put on the side of a road what's called a filter strip. And it's very simple. It's just the idea that if you put grass on the side of the road, then that's better than if you had gravel. Because if you have gravel on the side of the road, the water will flow over the surface of the gravel and accumulate in a ditch. But if you have grass, that just encourages the water to make its way down into the soil more easily. The roots in the grass penetrate through the soil matrix and make kind of a flow path for the water to get into the soil. So this is one way of decreasing the C value after we've paved a road that didn't used to be there. In uh, people's homes, sometimes if you walk around Huntington and look at the really old homes, you'll notice that the drain that comes off of someone's roof, you see this pipe? This pipe is connected to the roof of somebody's house. And in Huntington, a lot of times the pipe will go into the ground. Well, it's not just going into the ground and going to the soil. When someone has their roof drain going into the ground, what that means is it's connected to the pipe that goes out to the street. It's connected to the sewer. And um, that's bad because in many cities in the United States, especially in the eastern half of the country, where we have a combined sewer, which means rainwater and sewage is in the same pipe, then having rainwater all of a sudden flash flooding into the uh, drainage network will mean that sewage backs up into people's basements and it gets into the streets. And so it's a good thing to disconnect that. What The pipe that used to be going into the ground, cut the pipe and have it flow over their yard instead. Because all of this grass can probably absorb much of the rainwater. Um, another way of enhancing that is in this picture, here is someone's roof drain. And instead of just going to the grass, it looks like they've built sort of a little reservoir for the rainwater. Um, they have amended the soil. In Huntington, we have a lot of clay soils that aren't very good at absorbing water. So if you just have the pipe going onto your grass, and under the grass is clay, then maybe you'll have lots of puddling, and the water won't infiltrate very well. But in this picture, what they've done is they've excavated out the poor soil. They've put a bed of gravel underneath, maybe some sand. They've put high uh, high infiltrating capacity soils and then put plants in it to further promote infiltration down into the soil. And so this is just a, a nice disconnection with a special rain garden that's main purpose is to try and um, infiltrate water. Here bioretention is a fancy word for in the parking lot there are some weeds and that's there on purpose. You know, a big, and it doesn't have to be weeds. Obviously, they could put in some nice landscaping. But if you intermix landscaping with the parking lot, then that will give somewhere for the water to go besides to the storm drain. 
because what we want to do is try and prevent as much water from getting into the storm drain as we can because once it's in the storm drain in a concentrated form it's really hard to control but it's easy to control when it's just a shallow sheet flow it's not moving very fast when it's a shallow sheet flow there isn't very much of it so they always say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure this is prevention where at the source of the runoff as close to where the raindrop falls onto the ground that's where you want to solve your runoff problem is as soon as it hits the ground find some place for it to go otherwise it's going to accumulate and get out of control later on and so this is a good example of that where instead of putting in a pond near this parking lot their strategy is just to try and have the water run off of the parking lot into this uh, bioretention area so probably the slope of this asphalt is down towards this nice landscaped area. It wouldn't it be nice if this was like vegetables, you know, like lettuce and squash, and you just pull up to work and pick a squash on your way home. There's your dinner. Another option is to rethink the kinds of paving materials that we use. Concrete and asphalt aren't very porous, but what if you put in a, uh, a concrete block, like a cinder block, and then in the holes of the cinder block, fill that with gravel? That will allow at least some infiltration, um, and it still has enough structural stability to support the loads of a vehicle. Another option is uh, what's called porous concrete. And we'll watch a video of por oh, PowerPoint crashed. All right, let's see if, we'll give it another chance. This is a pretty good video, actually. Porous concrete. small, whatever. Aggregate is the rocks. Oh, did I never start? Okay, it's gone. Okay, so the aggregate, what else is in concrete? Cement, right? And sand, and finally water. Okay, so in this uh, porous concrete, they don't include the sand, or very little sand. It's only the cement and an aggregate. Usually they use a pretty small um, rock, but they, by omitting the sand, they're basically putting the cement around the rocks and the rocks um, will be cemented together and then there is a flow path between the large rocks for the water to get through. And so porous concrete, now there's some disadvantages to that. It doesn't work very well in places that have a vigorous freeze-thaw cycle. So places where during the winter time it will freeze at night, thaw during the day, freeze at night, you know, the, the water expands and contracts and it can break apart that concrete. So it's really important to have it well drained underneath. You can't put porous concrete on top of ordinary soil. You have to put it on, on top of a sloped gravel bed because when the water falls on there, you want it to drain through the concrete so it never has any opportunity of expanding and the ice cracking this, uh, the mixture. But 
I actually put a little bit of porous concrete on the driveway at my house this summer, and you know the water goes right through it. It's pretty interesting. Porous concrete? Well, uh, we call it, they call it switch tree base, but it, yeah. it looked just like porous concrete. Yeah. Um, a grass swale, a, a swale is another name for a ditch or a canal. And instead of having um, a concrete lined canal, if you try and encourage infiltration by putting grass lining on a channel and amending the soil by replacing clay with sands and gravels, that can also enhance infiltration. Um, here's a look at a parking lot and it's not quite a pond because it, it doesn't have an incoming pipe. This isn't a detention pond. You don't see that there's like a pipe that's collecting the network runoff, but it's just they have made a low point in a development and this gravel underneath it is some amended soils and it's just a place where they're trying to promote infiltration. Regenerative stormwater conveyance channel is a series of small pools and it looks like this is a very steep surface. Um, it looks pretty steep and ordinarily if you just had a normal channel there the water would move very quickly over that channel. Remember that actually we have two goals. Our goal isn't only to infiltrate additional water but also we're trying to slow the water down as it moves through the environment so that there isn't a flash flood. And what this does is a very good job of slowing the water down because instead of having a very steep channel that will have a high flow velocity. We have a series of pools and the water spends time in each pool and then it overflows to the next pool, overflows to the next and uh, this is going to be promoting infiltration because when you have a pond of water above the soil that pushes the water down into the, uh, into the soil that more than if it was a shallow sheet flow of the liquid and then um, the other thing is that until these are full, as it just begins to rain, it's like a series of connected ponds. And so it's very effective at reducing the, uh, uh, how quickly, the, reducing the speed of the water and therefore increasing the time of concentration or the time to peak. In some places, people put rain barrels connected to the roof and then they'll irrigate with that water. It's becoming really common practice in Australia where they've had a lot of um, uh, drought in the last 10 years. Um, it's not really economically feasible in too many places because you spend more on the barrel than you can ever collect the value of water. Um, I have a rain barrel at my house and I think it was $80. It holds about 50 gallons of water and 50 gallons of water has a value of about 50 cents. And so, you know, I'd have to drain it and refill it a lot of times to pay off the expense of the barrel and the hassle of installing it. But in some places, water is more scarce than here in West Virginia. We have a lot of water, so there's nothing too rare about it. But in Australia, they're really happy to have any rainwater that they can collect. Um, remember that it's not just asphalt and pavement that increases impervious area, but it's also roofs. And ordinarily, you want your roof to be watertight so that water isn't coming and ruining your quiz and hitting you on the head when you're trying to sleep. Um, but it's becoming common practice in like uh, these LEED certified buildings, you know, very green, eco-friendly new developments to try and put on a roof that will absorb water or even not just the roof, but sometimes they're also making the walls having vegetation on them. They call them green walls and they'll have plants. Um, they're not just splat on the side, they'll put little planters, but um, it allows water that falls onto this. It, it usually will be 12 to 18 inch depth of soil and then underneath it is a series of uh, a layer of gravel and drains running through that gravel that will collect the water. And so 
This will be usually pretty effective at collecting maybe the first inch of rainwater, but then after that, when the soil becomes saturated, any excess water will have to be routed through a pond or to the collection network. But, you know, it does something. I think it's supposed to. I don't know. I haven't heard a lot about it. Yeah, I, that's the intention, but I mean, with budget cuts and changes, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But they, I think they do want to have a green roof over there. I'll be interested to see. Um, sometimes there are also environmental concerns associated with runoff. And in this photo, you can see it's a gas station. And so there's going to be a lot of oil and maybe spilled fuel on the ground. So that when it rains, it's important for these guys to be capturing any rainwater that comes off of here and treating it to remove and filter out the organic pollutants. Constructed wetlands are another way of doing that same thing where the, uh, the biological system can filter out impurities in the water and prevent it from causing damage to the rest of the environment where if you have a big development and you intentionally put in a pond and you plant uh, like native grasses like cattails and there are certain fish species that do well in a constructed wetlands, then this is, can be a, a way, a, not only a place for the water to be stored, the volume of it, but also a place where um, sediments can be filtered out, uh, salinity can be removed, and you can get rid of nutrients. Because even something as simple as phosphorus and nitrogen, which comes from the farmer's uh, fertilizer that they'll apply to a field, it's good for the farmer's field, but it's really bad for the waterways. Uh, did anybody hear about what happened in Toledo, Ohio this summer with their water supply? Yeah, they, there was a big bloom of algae in Lake Erie, which is where Toledo, Ohio gets its water, so, uh, gets its water from. And the algae um, actually is toxic, and so um, the algae will bloom because there's a lot of fertilizer runoff from agricultural areas adjacent to the lake. And so we want to try and have these plants use up that phosphorus and nitrogen instead of letting the algae use up the phosphorus and nitrogen because the algae can release toxins that are very, very poisonous to humans. Whereas if these cattails grow, we'll just cut them down and throw them in a pile and they'll decompose. So it's much better to have a wetlands use up the nutrients. For the rest of the class, we're going to be looking at ponds. Um, there are a couple of different options with ponds. Uh, dry extended detention pond is one that when it's not raining, it's intended to be dry. And a wet pond is one that has water in it even during the periods that it's not raining, where there will be some additional capacity for storage. You know, the water levels will rise when it's raining, but then it stays wet over time, and that is able to be kind of scenic for people in the area and support aquatic habitat that a dry pond can't. So again, our objective is to reduce the amount of water that's running off. So promote infiltration and slow down the flow of water, and ponds do just that. They are meant to mitigate the effects of urbanization, and they're trying to uh, deal with the extra runoff volumes, the higher peak flow rates, and the pollutants that can accumulate. Uh, they're trying to make the curve of the runoff more like what it looked like before urbanization occurred. Now, I said that a pound of, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's better to just handle the stormwater at its source. Source control can include local disposal, which is you know, where the water is actually generated, try and deal with it there. Try and control water from getting into the inlets of the network and detain it on site. Because the downstream control measures are a lot more expensive, they're difficult to engineer, and extended detention basins is an example of something that could be considered a source control measure if it's small and close to the origin of where the stormwater is generated. But in most cases, it's more of a downstream control measure because you're already saying, well, I've got so much runoff flow and I have to do something with it to prevent it from washing out the stream. It's a temporary place to store it. So an extended detention basin, perforated riser, 
is where the water is going to be getting out of this pond. This is the one that's supposed to be dry when it is not raining. And so it will drain all the way to empty because we've got this pipe with perforations or holes. Now when the water level gets really high, you'll notice that it can go right through the opening on the top of the pipe. And so some of the water can get through the tiny little holes in the perforations. If it gets too high, it flows over the top and acts as a weir getting into this pipe. And then if it gets really high, there's an emergency spillway. And so it'll flow over the top of the edge of the, of the basin if the liquid levels get too high. Uh, these ponds are good for about 24 hour or maybe even more detention times. Uh, some of the ponds are used for drainage areas for up to 200 acres. There is a risk of mosquito breeding though because you're going to have pools of water and damp soil even after the pond drains and so uh, they have to kind of be maintained to make sure that there aren't stagnant puddles. A retention pond, on the other hand, is always going to have water in it. And so the perforations are at the top, not at the bottom. So if the perforations are at the bottom, then it would drain all the way to empty. But since these perforations are at the top, the water will only drain to the outlet when the liquid level rises above the perforations. Since it has um, already has like a vegetated and aquatic species in there, you don't have to worry about mosquitoes in the same way that you do with the dry pond, ironically, because presumably there are going to be fish and other predators of mosquitoes uh, in this pond that make it maybe less of a concern. It has the ability to remove pollutants because there's a, uh, a biological system there that's using up the nutrients. But if it's too deep, you can have anoxic conditions. Anoxic means that there isn't any dissolved oxygen. And you'll learn a lot about this in water and wastewater treatment. But if the pond is so deep that oxygen can't diffuse through the surface and make it to the bottom of the pond, then there can be like a zone of sludge and worms and just really nasty conditions at the bottom of the pond that uh, occasionally can give bad odors like hydrogen sulfide. Okay. Um, this is an outline of the method we're going to go through. Ideally, you have a runoff hydrograph that says, how much flow there is is a function of time. And we want to find out how can we make the pond bigger to make the outflow hydrograph smaller than the inflow hydrograph. And I'm going to illustrate it with this example using Excel. So you can follow along with Excel, or if you'd prefer, you can just watch and then uh, work through the example outside of class. This is the inflow hydrograph, and I've got it both graphically and a table of the flow rates that are showing um, the water coming out of the pipe. So the water comes into this pond. This pond is going to be 65 meters by 65 meters. We're assuming that it's rectangular. And I want to find out what will the flow rate out of the pond look like. And if you remember back to the project we did in hydraulic engineering, last semester. It's going to be somewhat similar to that where we look at the volume of water coming in, the volume of water going out. Basically, we're using a mass balance approach where accumulation, accumulation in the pond is the flow in minus the flow out. So what happens when the flow in is bigger than the flow out? Water will accumulate in the pond. So the water levels will go up as long as the flow rate in is more than the flow rate out. And then when the rain stops and the inflow hydrograph decreases, then in will be less than out and the liquid levels will decrease again. The water level will go down inside of the pond. So in my spreadsheet, I'm going to create columns that include the time and the inflow data that I'm given in the example. Okay, so here we have time, and that's uh, hours. I've got inflow, and that's cubic meters per second. And I'll just copy that data from the table that I have here. You can type it in, because you can't copy and paste off of the screen like I can. All right, 
So there we've got time and inflow. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to find out what is the volume in in cubic meters during the time increment. So during that first uh, hour, there isn't going to be any flow rate in because it's going to be this flow rate times each hour is 3,600 seconds. And then I can drag that down and it will apply the formula to each cell. So the volume in times 3,600 tells me during this hour, I, I'm assuming from, one, from hour one until hour two, during that one hour time increment, the flow rate is 0.3 cubic meters per second coming into the pond. And so if that's the flow rate and we have a one hour time period, this is the total amount that goes into the pond. That's the volume that flo flows into the pond. Um, all right. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have in the uh, column here that says accumulated volume. And this really won't make sense until, well, it won't make complete sense until you see the other columns that I put in because there needs to be a flow out, but we don't have the, uh, the flow out until we know how deep the water is. Okay. I'm going to have the depth. This is the depth of water inside of the pond. I'm going to have a column that I call H. And uh, H is the distance from the water surface to the center of the opening of the pond. Uh, um, the center of the opening of the pipe. Okay, so let's look at a cross section. Here is my pond. Here's the water surface. And here's the edge of it. If I have a pipe that's going out, let's say my diameter is this, okay, H is the distance from the center of the pipe up to the water, the water's edge. So here's my water. H is from the center line of the pipe up to the surface. And then the depth is the total depth of water from the surface of the water down to the bottom. So that's why there's a difference between depth and H. We're going to have outflow in cubic meters per second, and then volume out in cubic meters, volume out during the time increment. All right. I need to add a couple of rows here, because I need to put information about the size of the pond at the top. I want to have uh, the pond area. in cubic meters, oh, square meters, okay. It is 65 by 65, so I'm going to have equals 65 times 65. That tells me the area of my pond. Um, outlet pipe diameter. Now, is that defined in the problem statement? Do I have information about the diameter of the pipe? Let's see. It says here that um, the outlet pipe is 250 millimeters is the diameter of the pipe. And it also says the C sub D is 0.59. The C sub D that it's talking about is the flow out of here is governed by the orifice equation. You may remember the orifice equation from fluid mechanics. And what it says, the orifice equation, is if we have water coming out of an orifice, like a hole in a tank, the flow rate, Q, is C sub D times the area times the square root of 2GH. That's the orifice equation. We're acting like this pipe is an orifice. It's got a hole. The water has to go from the pond into that hole. And we can estimate the flow rate by how high the water is above the center line, h, square root of 2g, where g is just uh, the acceleration of gravity, 
A is the cross-sectional area of the orifice. And the C sub D tells us how much energy loss there is through that orifice. And so this opening has a C sub D of 0.59. Okay. So I'm going to put in my pipe diameter is 0.25. Uh, and I'm going to have uh, outlet pipe area. And the pipe area I calculate with pi, 3.14159, d squared divided by 4. So that's the area of the pipe. And then um, we also have the pipe C sub D. And that's 0.59. That was given in the problem statement. All right. Here's the trickiest part of the spreadsheet. It's always tricky when you're just getting started. Once you get a few rows in, you can just drag everything down and it solves itself. But in the beginning, we have to apply a little bit of judgment. So follow along with this part closely. Uh, at first, there's no accumulated volume because nothing flowed in and nothing flowed out at first. And so the depth is going to be zero. The height of water will be zero. There's nothing flowing out. And over the one hour time period, that means that there's no volume out. All right. Um, now, what about during the one o'clock to two o'clock time period? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much flowed out as a function of the previous hour. So during the 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, we have this much coming in minus the flow, the volume out from the previous hour. There wasn't any volume out. It's a, uh, it's a, a numerical approximation of what's happening on a simultaneous basis, but we have to divide it up into time increments to make sense of it computationally. OK, so if this is how much volume is in the pond at this time, then the depth of water will be this volume divided by the pond area. So this is how deep the water is if we've got um, this much volume in it. Now H and D are related. The difference is just half of the pipe diameter. So it's going to be the depth minus the pipe diameter, anchoring that, because I always want the reference to come back up there, divided by 2. Okay, I'm going to take a pause and see if anybody has questions. You know, it's one thing to know what formula to put into each cell, and you can look that up later. But the important thing that maybe the stumbling block here is, how did I come up with this accumulated volume? And the logic behind it is just, if I want to know how much water is in the pond right now, I have to look at how much there used to be. And then also I have to consider how much came in this hour and how much went out this hour. But I don't know how much is going to go out this hour until I know how much is there right now. And so it's kind of a circle that we have to use a little bit of creative thinking to get out of. So instead of saying how much is going out this hour, I say, well, how much went out last hour? Because I, I know that. I don't know how much is going to go out this hour until I know how much came in. But since the two are related, I have to uh, find some workaround. And my workaround is that the accumulated volume is going to be the flow in during this area. It has three components. I'll write it on the board. Accumulated volume is going to be accumulated oh, this pen's no good. Accumulated volume for this hour is going to be the accumulated 
volume last hour plus volume in this hour minus volume out last hour. All right. So there should be three components there. It should be the accumulated volume in the last hour plus the volume in this hour minus the volume out last hour. Okay? Okay. So, <clears throat> outflow. I calculate the outflow using the orifice equation. Equals C sub D times the pipe area. And I anchor both of those references because they're up here in the header and I always want it to look at those cells. Uh, C sub D times the area times the square root of 2 times 9.81 times H. Okay, so this is the orifice equation to calculate the outflow. And then volume out will be the flow rate out times how many seconds are in an hour, 3,600. And that tells us how much went out during this hour. So now, the accumulated volume during the 2 o'clock hour, if I just drag that formula down, now it says that there's uh, 1325, and that's looking at the volume that came in during this hour, the previous accumulated amount, minus the volume out during the previous hour. So it's keeping track of everything in the mass balance. How much was there before, what came in, what came out. It's just like accounting. In fact, we can drag this down too, and we can drag all of these down through the entire hydrograph, and it tells us what the outflow pond is looking like. And I need more time. I need to go uh, 12 o'clock. That's too small. You guys probably can't see that, right? <laughs> All right. So look at what's happening. Nope, something happened bad here. We want it to stay zero. That's more like it. Okay. I'm going to create a little graph that shows the the hydrograph of both the flow in and the flow out. Okay, I'll move it over here. All right, so Excel 2013 is a little different. If you want to add the data series, I'll select data, add. This one is going to be inflow, and my x values along the x-axis is going to be time. And then here will be the inflow rate. Let's make it through 24. And then we'll also add the outflow. Here is the time. And here is the outflow rate. And so it shows our pond is working. That's exactly what we want it to do, is we want the, uh, the flow to smooth out. The peak is later and the outflow rate is less. Okay, so what will be the peak flow rate out of the pond was the first question. And the peak flow rate out of the pond, the highest outflow it looks like is 0.17. Point, yeah, 0.17 cubic meters per second. Is there any questions? 
for H? Yeah. So H is going to be whatever the depth of the water is minus half of the pipe diameter because H is measured to the center line of the pipe. So we have to subtract out this small difference here, half of the diameter. Other questions? Accumulated volume. That's the tricky one, right? All right. It's the previous accumulated volume plus the volume in minus the volume out of the last hour. Now we can't do volume out for this hour because volume out for this hour depends on the accumulated volume of this hour. So it would be a circular reference. All right. If we wanted to find out what happens if we make that pond bigger, what if instead of 65 by 65, what if I make it 65 by 100? Now watch this. I'm just going to change one a couple of numbers here and it will automatically update my entire spreadsheet. If it's 65 by 100, what do you think that's going to do to the outflow hydrograph? If it's a bigger pond, that's even better. So look what it does to the outflow hydrograph. Makes it lower. What if the pond is smaller? What if I made it 25 by 25? What if I'm cheap? I don't want to buy too much land. I'm a cheap, greedy developer, and I want to put in a pond that's too small. Well, that brings the outflow rate up. So you can design, and in the homework assignment, I ask you to play around and find the right size for something. All that means is that you are playing around with the size of the pond until the outflow is doing what you want it to do. All right. There's two other slides that I want to show you in the 30 seconds that are remaining. We won't be able to work the example that I had planned out for you, but that's okay because it's, uh, these are both really simple formulas and there is an illustration in the book. Um, instead of going through that process and calculating, if you don't have an inflow hydrograph, you can't do what we just did. What we just did depends on having an inflow hydrograph. But what if all you know is the peak flow rate? So you assume a triangular inflow hydrograph and you can calculate the volume of storage that's needed according to this formula. This base time is how long the inflow hydrograph occurs and then you find the difference between the peak flow rate and the allowable peak outflow rate. That's what Q sub A means is allowable peak outflow rate. There's a different approach that uh, uses what's called the Apton Grig storage volume. You can find out that how big the pond should be. V sub S is estimating how large should be the pond. Then um, you find V sub R, which is the, uh, the volume of the runoff, the total runoff volume, and um, multiply it by this expression. What I'll do is I'll work this example that we were going to do, this comparison example since we're out of time. I'll work with the pencast and I'll email that pencast PDF to you. It's the solution PDF and also you'll hear me speaking through the solution. So you, you have to play it and you can hear and see the solution as it's being solved. Since we're out of time, uh, let's just take one final look at the announcements here. We'll look at more pictures when we get together next time, but that gives you all of what you need to know to start on the homework. Don't leave without grabbing a copy of the homework assignment because it's due in class on Tuesday. And then things will slow down, I promise. Here you go. Here's the homework. All right. Hope you have a great weekend.